And now, family, I want to draw your attention to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5. And this afternoon, we're going to be looking at verses 19 and 20 from Ecclesiastes 5. Once again, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 from the book that we love. And beginning at verse 19, it says, Furthermore, everyone to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also allowed him to enjoy them, take his reward, and rejoice in his labor. This is a gift of God, for he does not often consider the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with the joy of his heart. Let's ask the Lord for a special blessing. Father, we come before you once again this afternoon to give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be able to sit underneath the preaching of your word. I pray, Father, that you Spirit would be in our midst and dwell in the heart of every believer as we know he does, illuminating our minds and giving us understanding of what it is the scriptures want to teach us. We pray, Lord, for anyone who doesn't know you who might be in our presence, that they would come to know you, come to know Christ through the preaching of your word. And Father, for myself, I pray that the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart would be Please in your sight. I ask, Lord, that you forgive me my own imperfections, God, in this most holy task of preaching your word. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege. I ask that you give me the permission to preach it. And most of all, I thank you for him and his name my tongue. And with somebody who loves him, shout amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. My sermon title is work, worry, wealth, and worship. Now, whenever a tragedy or a travesty of some sort takes place in the life of a believer, you can be sure most of the time that a non-believer will be there to say, where was your God when that happened? When an infant dies, when you get laid off and can't find work and can't provide for your family, they will often ask, how can you continue to worship a God that will not help you? A God that did not prevent those things from happening. How do you continue to praise Him and say that He is good? How can you believe in a God like that? And I know for myself, personally, I've been guilty of the sin where when things didn't go my way, when tragedy hit, trials, tribulation, the pain of life happens, I have not wanted to give God praise. I have not wanted to come to the house of the Lord singing His praises. I have felt like, what's the point? Over and over and over again, problem after problem after problem, trial after trial after trial, there have been those moments where I have felt like, what's the point? My life is just as painful as it was before I was a Christian. I'm sure you've been there as well. We've all been there. We've all been in that place where life gets very painful and you start to ask yourself, what's the point of believing in God, being in His Word, praying to Him, making petitions, asking over and over again if it doesn't make a difference. I'm sure we've all been in that place. Now, the reason why both you and I feel that way is because oftentimes we are more concerned or we desire the comfort and security of this life more than we desire Jesus. 
That's the reason why. We are in a position where our flesh would rather idolize the gifts more than worship the giver. Where we would rather be more, or, or I should say, we're more motivated to go to work in order to acquire these earthly treasures that we think are going to bring peace and security to our lives, more so than we're motivated to come and worship the God who is the ultimate source of every dollar, penny, job, whatever it is that we might have or want. And that is the sad reality for even us as Christians at times. Now, after this message, I want you to understand why it is that you can rejoice in the God of your salvation despite any circumstance. And so what I want to teach this afternoon, or what I call my tattoo for the heart, is this. Be grateful for the creaturely comforts that God gives you, but adore Him for the acceptance and affection found in Jesus. Let me say that again. Be grateful for the creaturely comforts God gives, but adore Him for the acceptance and affection found in Jesus. And so what I want to give you from this text is three attitudes to have in order to always rejoice despite circumstances. The first is going to be to enjoy the wealth that God gives you, but don't trust in it. The second is going to be enjoy all the gifts that God gives you, but acknowledge where they come from. And the third is going to be enjoy the greatest gift far above all else, no less not even equal to the others. And so the first attitude that I want you to have is to enjoy the wealth God gives you, but don't trust in them. And the, the first part of verse 19 says, Furthermore, everyone to whom God has given riches and wealth, we'll pause right there. So the word furthermore, is speaking of the fact that Solomon, uh, yeah, Solomon is continuing his discourse that he started where he's talking about the vanity of life. Where he has been painting a very dark picture for us and showing us that in life at the end of the day all is vanity is what he's been saying. A very dark and bleak and sad picture he's painted. Now he's going to switch over and he's going to now talk to us about the fact that there is the fact that God blesses his people with wealth and with riches and he does so for their enjoyment. Now, I always tell young men, if you want to learn about money and women, read Solomon. Solomon was the richest and wisest man that ever lived, and he has 700 wives and 300 concubines. The little rappers that you listen to know nothing about money and women compared to Solomon. Read Proverbs, read Ecclesiastes, read the Song of Solomon, and you will have all the wisdom and knowledge that you need in those two categories. Again, the richest, wisest man with 700 wives and 700 concubines. Now, this particular verse here, Solomon is going to tell us for the fourth time in this same book, Ecclesiastes, that eating and drinking and finding satisfaction in the work of your hands is very good in the sight of God. He tells us here the source, first and foremost, of where wealth and riches come from. They come from God himself. Now, many Christians falsely believe that having money is bad. We know the, the verse that is often misquoted, that money is the root of all evil, which we know really says that the love of money is the root of all evil, of all kinds of evil, I should say. 
But the reality is, is that acquiring wealth and having money is not sinful. God commands that we work, that a man provide for his household, not he's worse than an unbeliever. That he blesses the work of our hands and gives riches. Can money be dangerous on a stumbling block? Absolutely. Everything in this world can. We can turn anything into an idol. Money is not exclusively the only one that that can happen to. Is it just for pleasure? Is money just for enjoyment? No. It's also for providing. It's also for giving to uh, the church, for the furthering of God's kingdom. It's also to aid and help the poor and the needy. There are many functions that money has apart from pleasure. Can money be a curse? Yes, for some people. For some people, that's their idol. That's their stumbling block. And the more they get, the worse their life gets. Money will destroy some people. The soul will a number of different things. So money is not intrinsically evil. Can it be used for evil by wicked men? Absolutely, 100%. But that doesn't make the money itself evil. People are evil. And even as Christians, we can do wicked acts with money as well. When people want their money to multiply and are willing to do anything to make that happen, that is when the real problem comes about, which is the sin of greed. Okay? Greed is the problem. Being greedy is the problem. Never being content with what the Lord has provided Never being satisfied with the lot that God has given you and saying, God will give me more, I'll take matters into my own hands. I just got to have more. And I'll have it at any cost, and I'll cheat anybody, step over anybody that I need to in order to have what I want. God has said, use your money to bring you joy, not to bring you trouble. And we have to use our money in that way. Now, it's very important to understand that money in and of itself does not bring happiness. What brings happiness is having gratitude toward the giver, not just the enjoyment of the gift. If you want to be happy, you have to enjoy what God has given you now. So, if, if, if you'll allow me to illustrate, if you want steak and potatoes tomorrow, that's fine, but be thankful for beans and rice today. Apart from that, you will never be happy. So family, God has given you money as a blessing for you to enjoy the fruit of your labor. Enjoy it, but enjoy it now. Enjoy it today. There was once a man who was known for two things. Working all the time and never spending money. Okay, he was he was known for being the individual that for forty plus years of working never missed a day of work. Even when there was no work, he would make a day out of sweeping the shop. He was always working and he never spent a penny unless he absolutely had to. People would even make fun of this individual. They would make all kinds of jokes. They would say he's probably got bars of gold in his room that he pets and caresses and hugs at night before he goes to bed. They would joke around and wonder how much money he actually had saved up. The mind was boggled even thinking about it. But one day, like for every other man, this individual died. And as he was walking to the pearly gates with his bars of gold in his hand, St. Peter looks it, up and, looks it up and says, what are you doing with those blocks of concrete? And the man says, concrete? Are you kidding me? You know what this is? This is pure gold right here, my friend. And Peter tells him, well, the streets here are paved with that stuff. Fam, you can't take it with you. You, got, you can only enjoy it now. You won't be able to take your riches with you. You gotta enjoy the fruit of your labor today. God has given you money for this life, not for the next one. It's worth nothing in the next life. 
Now some might say, are you saying that we shouldn't save money? No. What I'm saying is that you shouldn't hoard money. You shouldn't save money in such a way where you think that you need to keep as much as you can because you don't know if tomorrow you'll have work, if tomorrow you'll be able to pay your bills. That's trusting in riches, not in the God who provides. A person who hoards is a person who doesn't understand that they have the great provider to provide for them and they don't have to have scarcity mentality like that, right? Not that there's anything wrong with saving, but there's something wrong with hoarding. And some people say, well, no, well, hoarding is just for junk. I'm, I'm hoarding money. In heaven, it's all junk. It's not going to be worth nothing. You can't take it with you. And so, fam, we need to rejoice that Christ gives gifts to his people for their enjoyment. However, he doesn't give it to us that we would put our trust in those things. That is diametrically opposed to the reason why he gives them. He gives them to us so that we might trust in him, knowing that every good and perfect gift comes from above. And so let me ask you this. Do you feel the need to hoard? Do you feel the need to get as much stuff as you possibly can and hold on to stuff? And Do you stay awake at night worrying, am I going to lose this, am I going to lose that? That's not, the, that's not the mentality of an adopted child. That's the mentality of an orphan. An orphan thinks that way. I've got nothing, i got to get my own. An adopted child or a king does not worry about those things. doesn't mean we have no concern for them. We just don't worry about them. We know that the one who gave you the first child can give you a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth. And so you need to find the strength to live a joyful life in the giver of the good gifts, not the gifts themselves. And now my second point is that you need to enjoy all the gifts God gives, but acknowledge where they came from. So it continues by saying in verse 19, at the second part of 19, it says, He has also Allow him to enjoy them, take his reward, and rejoice in his labor. This is a gift of God. So, God gives riches and he gives wealth. That is a gift. But his gifts go beyond riches and wealth. There are people who have riches and are yet some of the most miserable people you will ever meet in your life. Money does not automatically make you happy. I'm sure you know that by now. God gives his children more gifts, and they're listed in that section. He gives them the ability to work for their wealth and to enjoy that wealth. Right? And so don't miss that very important point. I've seen godly people who have very little and yet are some of the happiest people you ever met in your life. Have some of the worst jobs you could, not, you could ever imagine. And yet are always thankful for God's provision. Why is that? Because God has not only given them the gift of some wealth, but has also given them the second gift, which is the ability to enjoy it. God teaches us something. He teaches us the principle of gratitude. An attitude of gratitude is the key to enjoyment. The key to enjoying your life, your wealth, whatever it might be, whatever it might be, your money, whatever, is not to have more. It's to be grateful for whatever you have. And if you can do that, it won't matter how much you have or don't. You will always be content because it is ultimately the proper perspective of gratitude, which is truly what makes the heart glad. Now, it is God's intention for you to enjoy every gift that he has given you, all of them. But to, the key to finding the joy is always to have a thankful heart that thanks him. A person who counts their blessings will always be joyful. Always. 
Now, there was a couple that went to a, a local grocery store, to a uh, liquor store, I should say, to buy some wine before they were going to a family reunion dinner. And while they were there, the, the boyfriend uh, bought a lottery ticket as well. Now, the next day, the girlfriend asked him if, if, he could, if she could have it. Yeah, he was like, yeah, that's fine. And so she played it, and she won $10 million. He, of course, got half of it. But then, when his ex-wife found out that he was worth $5 million, she went and took half of that. And now he only had $2.5 million. And then his family came, and his friends came, and all started asking for help, for him to bail them out, for all these different things. And at the end of the day, he sat down on the porch and said, a measly $1 million, that's all I have left. And you might ask yourself, how can a person with a million dollars be miserable? That's what happens with a person that counts their burdens and not their blessings. Doesn't matter what you have, you will be miserable if that's the way you function and the way that you operate. Now, someone might ask, are you saying that we shouldn't try to improve our current uh, situation? That we shouldn't try and strive to to make more money. No, I'm not saying that. Go ahead and do that. But make sure that you're giving God things in the present. Because if you're not, you will never be happy. It doesn't matter how much you get. Your endless greed will never be satisfied. You need to be content with what God gives. And now, I love reading the prayers of Jesus. I love reading the Psalms. Why? Because they're sprinkled with petitions but they're drenched with praise. Thanking God not when the situation gets better, but even as they wait, they have the, their hearts are glad and nothing can take their joy away from them. Do you feel the need to improve your life for the sake of identity satisfaction? Is it not enough for you that the God of the universe is in control? and that you are his child. Is that not enough to satisfy you? I love what St. Augustine said. He said, Oh, greedy man, what will satisfy you if God won? If the God of the universe will not satisfy you, nothing ever will. And so family, make sure to throw up those, those petitions. But make sure that it's after you throw up praise. Thank him for what you have, because you don't deserve any of it, and neither do I. And yet he gives and gives and gives and gives more. Find your strength to live joyfully in the God who is the giver of the good gifts, and not in the gifts themselves. And so, we've seen so far that we got to enjoy God's gifts, all of them, but never trust in them never have our faith in them, but instead of the God who gives them. And now my third and final point is this. Enjoy the greatest gift above all else, not any less or even equally. In verse 20, he says, For he does not often consider the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with the joy of his heart. People will stop crying about the past and stop worrying about the future and they begin to enjoy God's gifts in the present. We will stop hyper-focusing on our earthly worry when we start to thank God in the present for the things that we have. Trials, tribulations, like the death of an infant can cause us to say, what's the point? Why, God? Why do you let these things happen? Again, when you lose a job and you haven't had work for two years. God, what's the point? I'm here every week. I praise you. You just ignore me. It's easy to feel that frustration with God. What is the point? This is the point. The point is, is that this life is going to go, and it's going to go very quickly. What you should be concerned with is eternity. 
Eternity should be what you are most concerned about. And for the Christian, here's what eternity will be like. The prophet Isaiah, in chapter 65, verses uh, 21 through 24 says, this is, this is speaking of what the kingdom of God will look like when it comes in its fullness, when we as believers dwell in the fullness of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what it's going to look like. He says, people will build houses and live in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and others live in them. They will not plant and others eat. For my people's lives will be like the lifetime of a tree. My chosen ones will fully enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor without success or bear children destined for disaster. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord along with their descendants even before they call an answer, while they, are, while they are still speaking, I will hear. In the future, we will no longer fall short of the glory of God. We will bathe and rejoice in the glory of God. Instead of crying about why this trial is happening, we will rejoice that the trial happened for a specific purpose that was necessary. This is not just some simple truth to provide momentary distraction from the pains of life. No, this is real truth that brings real peace that surpasses all understanding. It's not wishful thinking. It's real hope in a real future world that we will live in. And, and when we focus on that, this is what causes us to rejoice despite any circumstance. You need to ultimately unhitch your joy, your happiness from worldly possessions, because nothing needs to change in order for you to be happy. You can't love God, you can't adore Him for the gifts that He gives. He's not your sugar debt. You must thank Him for those things and be grateful for those things, but you must only adore Him and love Him for the affection and acceptance that you find in Jesus and for no other reason. It's been well said that joy is the flag that flies over the castle of our, of our hearts announcing that the king is now in residence. Not tomorrow, now he's in residence. You have everything that you need right this moment. Not tomorrow, now when you get the new job, now when you pay off your credit cards, right now. Your motivation to come and worship is not your circumstances. It's what happened on the cross. That should be your motivation for coming here every Sunday and for worshiping God all the days of your life. Now, some might ask, are you saying that I need to completely forget about my past and not prepare for the future? No, what I'm saying is that you should not identify with past anymore, and that you should not worry about the future that you might not even live, you might die, Jesus might come back, but instead identify with the present reality that in Christ you are loved and accepted, and nothing can ever change that. As the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 8, he's concerned that there's nothing, nothing in heaven, on earth, below the earth, you can search deep and wide, far and near, and you'll find nothing that will separate you from the love of God, not even yourself. And so, family, if Jesus is your reason for li living, then you never, ever, ever have a reason to quit. Ever. Do you still feel the need to find a purpose for your life? Do you still feel the need to find a hobby? Do you still feel the need to be a part of some particular club or group in order to have some sort of satisfaction with who you are as a person? It's never going to happen. It's never found in the gifts. If God gives you those things, thank you for it. But ultimately rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Enjoy Him above all else because you already have them. And so remember to enjoy the blessings, the wealth, the job that God gives you. Enjoy all of them. 
thinking that, acknowledging that he gives it and also gives you the ability to enjoy it. But above all else, adore him for Christ. Come on, just be grateful for Christ. Adore him for him. Regardless of what happens in every situation in your life, don't just say it is well. Follow it up by saying, God, you have done everything very, very well. You have done every, you orchestrated everything in my life perfectly. And as a congregation, I want to give you the challenge to pray the ACTS acronym, which is A, adoration, C, confession, T, thankfulness, S, supplication and prayer. People often ask me, what's the difference between A and T? Adoration and thanksgiving, isn't it the same thing? Thank you, God, praise you, God? It's not. You adore him in the beginning for the gospel. You thank him in the middle after for the gifts that he gives you. There's an order to this thing. The secret to life is to enjoy day by day the things that God gives us, knowing that the greatest gift can never be taken from us. In terms of blessings in this life, there isn't always a clear distinction between the righteous and the wicked. But one day, there will be. One, there's coming a day where there will be a clear distinction between the righteous and the wicked. The wicked will hunger and not be satisfied, and the righteous will eat and drink and find satisfaction. They will cry no more, their tears will be dried up, and it will be the wicked that will not find an end to their agony. And all of this for the righteous is not because of anything they've done, but what Jesus has done in their place. Let us worship him, let us proclaim him to a dying world. And always remember that we seek him, we adore him, we love him for what he's already done, not for what he's going to do in the future. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we confess that we have not always uh, had this proper order when it comes to our gratitude and adoration. We admit, Lord, that we often are more ecstatic about you giving us a new job or some earthly comfort more, more than our heart leaps for joy for the gospel. Please change that. We will work in our hearts now, Holy Spirit, that we would be a people that truly, truly get the gospel in such a way that people cannot contain our worship, our excitement for what it is that we believe in our hearts. We thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.